All right, hello everyone. We'll probably have some more people filtering in through the next few minutes, that's totally fine. Um, my name is Carissa, I am a staff member here at UCCS. Uh, I am the chairperson of a new group that we have called Bloom. Um, it's blossoming, learning, overcoming opportunities and mastery. And we're focused on youth incarceration outreach and then also working on outreach here at our campus community because right now it's faculty and staff. We will probably have some student opportunities in just a bit. And this is actually our very first event. We're doing a kickoff here. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. And I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Mr. Ryan Forbes. He's coming up from Longmont today and is part of, is one of our external partners for Bloom. Uh, he has two comics published now at waywordpress.com. That was in your email um, if you wanted to download the newest comic for free. Uh, he is at the Longmont Recovery Cafe and does the Shakedown podcast. So I'm going to keep my, uh, my spiel a little short. My last thing is there's a few small snacks, and if you need the restroom, it's just out those doors and to the right, or my right. So awesome. Everybody, let's welcome Ryan. Hello, everyone, and thank you for, for coming out today. Um, and basically, really, the first thing I wanted to say is I just really wanted to, um, I've been working with a lot of people, a lot of staff, a lot of faculty, a lot of students out here. And I just wanted to say thank, thank you. And I've, I've just been totally impressed by everyone here at UCCS. Um, it's been really a really fun experience putting this together. Um, and I'm really excited to give this presentation. And um, hopefully everyone can get a lot out of it. And um, the next thing, part of it too, is you might have been able to tell from the title, is that I'm going to talk about a whole bunch of different things. And I totally expect questions to come up. And um, I know we've got people online too, and Chris is going to help with that. So if you have any questions or concerns or like or any clarification or anything, um, please don't feel free to raise your hand and I can go in and clarify because I'm going into a whole bunch of different topics for this and uh, I'm happy to clarify and we've definitely got the time for that today. And um, yeah, so um, with that said, and also I'm gonna have some time at the end for like if you wanna have deeper conversation about any one of the topics as well. So, which brings me to who am I <laughs> and why am I here? Um, as Carissa said, I just got done, um, like finished with a sort of justice graphic novel, which is kind of the main, which was a main project I've worked on for the past three years. And before that, I actually, my main career was as um, a software developer. Um, I got a degree um, in computer science from Montana State University. And um, I worked in that for about a decade. And um, that, um, that career was working in startup companies and Fortune 500 companies. Um, I worked one, I worked at ski.com and I also worked at the company that basically um, any place you got a ski ticket from or any place where you see the gates open up for you when you go skiing, that I worked on that software. And, um, and then I also worked for the Department of Defense and I worked on their communications. So I got to see some of that too. So I had a bunch of different experience in that and that became my sole focus after a long while and part of what um, part of what put a pause on that was um, after when that became my focus, I put I ignored my family, my friends, and even my own health, and because I was just focused on what's the next best thing for my career, and um, that ended up in me causing a crash that cost another person their life. And then I went to, um, I was in Texas at the time. I got a 10 year prison sentence plus 10 years of probation, but the sentence itself 
of a judge in the county I was in because there it was intoxicated manslaughter. The county I was in, they were very strict about any intoxicated offenses. So the sentence ended up getting very um, complicated. And he wanted to kind of like make his own example of me in a weird way. So what, what ended up coming of that was this community service aspect of the sentence. Um, so what he, what was on one of my restrictions for the, the sentence was this 400 hours of community service. And he said that the community service was needed to be public speaking at schools. And um, like, and he meant like elementary, middle school, high schools is kind of what he was thinking. And, but the thing was is um, when I got, I got an interstate compact to come out to be here when I got released from prison to come out and be here with my family. And when probation saw this condition um, here in Colorado, they're like, you can't do this. This is not a way you can, we can't count you, first off, as a felon, you cannot, we're not letting you into um, schools to go do this. And two, um, you're not, like, this is not a way we're gonna count your community service hours. And so the interstate compact has to, works with the laws of both states. So they had to figure out some sort of compromise to make, so I could fill out these 400 hours. So um, they were, for a while, they were trying to figure out what would do this, what, what, what could actually fulfill these, these hours. And so they were like, well, what are you doing right now? And at the time, I was actually, I was months out of prison. I was um, living with my mom in Niwot, Colorado. And if you don't know where Niwot, Colorado, don't worry, most people don't. Um, so, um, so I'm out in the middle of nowhere. I'm like just trying to get on my feet out of prison. Um, trying to figure out, but the one project I do have going was that. Um, that is a comic that I published with my friend who also had just gotten out of prison. Um, his name was Malone. And we got, we basically, he had a, he spent 30 years in Texas prisons. He was there starting in the 90s when they were like, wanted to lock everybody up. They still kind of do in Texas, but they he got locked up as a teenager and one of the things that he wa he knew he wanted to do was to draw comics and he had 30 years of art just piled up. And he had a he had this nearly finished comic um just sitting there on copy paper and he didn't know what to do with. And I said, what, I had been wanting to do a comic book with him since I was writing comics and he was drawing comics and he does um, some amazing artwork. And I said, let's, we need to do a comic. How can we make this happen? And he said, well, I need to f publish this, this other one first and then I can do our comic. And so I was like, it just, the one he had just needed lettering and to be sent to a printer. And so I'm like, all right, I'll do it. I'll, I'll make that happen. So I had to find out, I had to learn lettering, um, which was a lot, so like putting letters on artwork was a lot more time consuming than I expected. And then I had, and then learning about printers, which, I will get into um, as I get into the publishing side of the, the, this talk, but that was that was what I was doing. So I was just wrapping up the publishing this comic. So when probation heard about this, they were like, "Well, I'm we're going to refer to you um, to our restorative justice department." And when restorative justice department heard about this, they're like, "Well, what do you think about doing a restorative justice graphic novel?" And, um, and the reason they were asking that is because the restorative justice department at that time was doing some really interesting stuff. They were doing, 
they were doing restorative justice music, restorative justice paintings, restorative justice um, videos and um, plays and things like that to tact. And it's a big part because they're trying to act out people's stories so that victims and perpetrators and everyone can get their hurt stories heard emotion like basically like they can initiate a healing process between everyone involved in crimes. And so I guess I need to um, bring a little summary here about what is restorative justice. Restorative justice, as opposed to what, like the, the, the standard criminal justice system that you have in our, like right now, like when you go, you get arrested, you go to court and all that, it's adversarial, it's the prosecution versus the defense, and you're trying to fight to see how much time you get, how severe the sentence it is. Sort of justice is about how can we heal every person who's involved and get things, and, and just because it's, the assumption is everyone's been damaged by the crime that's been done, by the harm that's been done, how do we actually heal them? So the Boulder County Restorative Justice Department was trying to incorporate art into that process. So that's when they came to me and they asked, well, what do you think about doing a sort of justice graphic novel? And I immediately said, not a good idea. <laughs> I don't think that's, an, that's great. I don't think that's going to work. I think I can see a lot of problems with that. And also, the idea was I was going to um, basically tell my story of killing someone and then at the end like ap like have my apology that I never got to say to the victim and their family because there was no restorative justice pro process in Texas. There was no aspect of that and, there, and that's standard in the adversarial process. You're not going to have an apology. You're not going to make that. That's not a standard process. So it's like this would be a way to like make have that apology out there. And I was like, I it was a lot to take in. I was like, I don't think that's that's gonna work. So, but as we're talking about that, I'm thinking about um what Malone and I talked about in prison. Because in prison we actually studied comics. Like we didn't, we were, we enjoyed comics. We had piles of comics that we had gathered over decades and we, we studied them. And Malone actually, one of the, his biggest things that he helped me to understand is that whereas most people buy a comic because they like Spider-Man or they like Batman or they like Gotham City or they like DC or they like Marvel, he's like, no. You really, most people don't like any of those things. What they like are really good writers and really good artists. And if you have those working on the comics, those will be the people who, those will be what you gravitate towards. And even if you, it's a character you don't really like, you may not like, um, may not like He-Man or Swamp Thing or something like that. Swamp Thing was an untouchable character for a very long time. It was an unpopular comic. Um, people didn't like it. Then Alan Moore got a hold of it, and all of a sudden, it was the most popular comic for for most of the '90s. Um, and then he showed me, he introduced me to people like this. This is a panel. This is part of a panel from Brandon Graham. Brandon Graham would do things like have these settings like this where there's so much going on in the setting, there's so much detail in there that you could spend a half an hour looking at it and you still wouldn't see all the detail or all the little things happening in that scene. Um, he would put, he would make puns everywhere so that there would be puns like every, the, like there would be advertisements that would be in itself a, a pun, like there would be a, a security device called the Later Gator or there would be, um, there's all sorts of, uh, or characters' names would be in themselves puns. And then you'd also have, you'd actually use word balloons as objects that became crucial that the characters use inside the story. 
which you could only do inside a comic or a graphic novel, which is something I ended up borrowing from him inside my graphic novel. Um, and I did this, I ended up like, and then I learned from not just Brandon Graham, but other big artists and writers that I um, learned from. Like I said, there's Al Moore with like V for Vendetta with like these, which is an amazing storyline. Like I really love the idea of is having like incorporating revolution and everything into the storyline. There's Brian Michael Bendis who made one of the most um, iconic Spider-Mans, and honestly, most people, when they think of a Spider-Man-like story, they're usually thinking of Brian Michael Bendis. And uh, and then art, one of my favorite artists is like John Romita Jr., and that was someone I studied all the time when I was trying to do, you know, trying to draw my characters. And um, then he also, like, that, that panel is from one of the, my favorite, like, Plant, Black Panther storylines and everything that I've ever read. So those all showed me, like it. I learned from from Inside with Malone that these things. It wasn't about necessarily the genre or the character or even necessarily the plot. It was about the storyteller and how they told the story that made it really interesting and powerful. So that. Um, that made it interesting and it also, it would be an interesting challenge and also be way better community service than spending 400 hours picking trash on the side of the highway. So, um, so that made, that kind of sold me on, we're gonna make, like doing this graphic novel and trying to uh, make this happen. And so we, so basically the graphic novel gets the green light and we go and um, I get to, that becomes my community service. I start tracking hours for making this community service graphic novel. And um, I'm working with Boulder County Community Service, um, mainly with like there's um, uh, Deb Witzel and another person who, a uh, guy named Oliver who is not, he's not on that team anymore. but. Deb Witzel of Three Stories Consulting was my biggest help throughout this process. Person who I had to end up going back to again and again and again. And we had to go through this whole process. And um, she, it was very important to have them on the process with me and they knew that this was not going to be easy, that um, me going through and writing this story was not going to be an easy or light process. I thought, I was like, I'm just going, my, my main goal was about making it interesting. I wasn't even thinking about how this was going to affect me trying to write this down on paper. And they were like, no, you need to, you're gonna run into some issues. And I did, and like the first issue kind of came up when like I was trying to write about like the actual crash, like in the early pages. Like I was trying to figure out how I was gonna depict it, how what that scene was going to look like um, and how that would end up. And then the next um, part was when, was talking about when I actually got to the sentencing hearing um, and which is the most like, in throughout the actual process was the most emotionally charged event for me, my family, the victims, everyone involved, it was that sentencing hearing. And what, what ended up happening is because I was working with this restorative justice team and we were able to talk about these issues and they were like, when I was writing these, I got stuck. I was like, it was, I did not know how to move on from there, but they encouraged me, they kept me going, and I was able to actually continue the writing, and these actually became the most impactful turning points of the story, and I'm really happy with how they turned out. And then eventually, later on, when the story, as I was actually drawing the story, um, there were lots of points where 
we, I was realizing when taking this from storyboard to actual physical art, like the art wasn't going to translate the way it looked like in the storyboard. And we actually had to rewrite the story and we actually had to change the whole ending of it. And then that became, we actually were able to make the ending, I feel like have more of an impact than it would have if we had just made it the, the original intention, which was just me just saying, I'm sorry at the end. Um, and I'm very happy about that too. And it's also because I got to work with these people who have experience with this restorative justice process. So storyboarding, um, this, was a, this was a thing I had a lot of experience with um, that started with in prison. And the way it actually started out um, was that, so a lot of the comics I read, they had like in the graphic novel collections, they'd have storyboards in the back and they were written just like screenplays. So you could see the screenplay in the back of the book and I'd read them and I'd get to see, and it was really interesting because you get to see the changes they made from the original storyboard to the finished product. And sometimes it was like little minor things. And you're like, why did they change that? And sometimes it was really major things, but it was like, you can see like, oh man, that's, I'm really glad they made that giant shift. And it's, re and it's really different. And I learned talking to Malone that like the storyboards were written, they're like addressed directly to the artist. Like, hey, we can do it this way or may, they, the writer might give the artist a few options for like a panel or something like that. And um, so I, I basically, I didn't, um, when I first wrote my first storyboard, I didn't have an artist in mind or anything. What I was writing about was I was uh, reading a lot of DC comics and my favorite character was Kyle Rayner, Green Lantern, and DC hates him for some reason. They really don't like him, and they really like, like, they, they don't want to put him in movies, they don't want to touch him, and anytime there's something bad happens, they want to just, they want to, like, they'll make him the person who everything bad happens to. And so, I decided that I'm gonna write a storyline where you can see, like, look at what you have with this character. He's really, there's a lot you can do with him. So I wrote one of those storyboards just like I'd seen it in the back of the graphic novels without having an artist in mind and without ever having, like, drawn a full comic myself. And, um, and then this was before I met Malone. And then when I met Malone, and he found out, because I didn't tell him directly, he found out I had this storyboard. He's like, I want to read what you wrote. I was like, oh, you don't like Green Lantern. He's like, it's fine. I'll read it anyway. Let's see, let's see what this thing is. And uh, he read it. And he's like, this is great. You should just get rid of the, you should just make it not Green Lantern. <laughs> just make it your own character and just sell it yourself. And I'll get into why. That's a really good idea later. But that's, but, um, it was, he really loved the story. And then I was, because I knew he was such a good artist, I'm like, why don't you draw some of the pages? And he tried, and then he came back to me and he's like, you know what, why don't you try and draw the pages and then see what happens? And I started to realize that I was doing way too much in the storyboards. I was doing, un putting unrealistic, uh, expectations on the artist. Um, I was putting tons of panels, like like on that Alan Moore thing, I was looking at, I, one of the things I noticed right away when I put up that slide, he has like nine panels in a page, but he also has like ones, like just an extreme close up and all this kind of stuff. And there's certain things he does, but he also has, um, he does different, he, he like it's also black and white, but he doesn't have a whole bunch of characters in each one of those panels. I was putting eight panels on a page, putting and then throwing every character in the whole DC universe in those panels. And it was killing the artists. They were going, having to 
work overtime to draw all these things out. And, um, and so what the next thing I did was the next time I had a story idea, I just decided to try and see if I could put it directly into a comic. And I realized very quickly how I need, what I needed to do. I couldn't put too many characters in a scene unless I was doing it like, a, unless it was like a big splash or something. I couldn't, it, like I needed to limit it to like four or five panels on a page, things like that. And also now when I do my storyboards, I draw them. I don't write them anymore. They're not, um, they're not going to be, they're basically, they're, I don't write them like they're plays. I draw them like basically as stick figure comic books so that I have the proportions, I can see the panels, and I can read them just like the comic book and then go from there. Still, like even when I was doing this graphic novel, I still had scenes where I had crammed too many people into a like a scene or had put too much on a page because I was really trying to I'm like this is what the pacing should be on a page like it should have start with this beat and end with this beat and then I was putting too much into there when I could do it at slightly a different speed um, if you for for understanding pacing and things like that in comics I highly recommend um, Scott McCloud's uh, Understanding Comics. Uh, it's a great book on breaking down like when you can, t how, how you can ever, like you can take scenes, break them apart, and then pull out scenes and see how they affect your pacing and how it works. Which is, and a lot of people do that, they'll actually take a storyboard and actually just like cut it into the, to the panels and then they'll see what it looks like if they actually take away the squares or add other squares back in and see what how it reads and what it looks like. So I highly recommend anything on first like as far as Scott McCloud as far as like understanding how to like write a good story in comics. But yeah, those suggestions that Malone gave me about writing it myself and all that kind of stuff, um, that was like over a year long period before I actually was taking the advice. At first I was still trying to cram a whole bunch in, I was trying to get him to draw the comics, but I eventually took it and I eventually made those things happen. But so it was, it, it, I remember early on in this process, like just listening to other people was hard. So. Definitely, it's important. Listen to the feedback you're getting getting early on, and even though I was really like, oh, I, if you can just do this or this, uh, or you know, if someone else can just do this for me, um, or like the practicing and doing it yourself really pays off in the end, so you can see how it works. So, um, so another thing. There were a lot of different motivations too that went into the book. Um, like when I was writing it, I, there was the restorative justice aspect that we had Boulder County restorative justice getting into. But another thing I had to keep in check like that, that I constantly wanted to write into the book was kind of like my strong activist mission statement, which is basically prisons are bad. Um, they're bad, they shouldn't exist. and that I didn't, I wanted to show how awful they were and like kind of how my issues kind of with the current justice system. Um, and I was, when I was writing, there was a whole, there was a kind of a whole, one of the big issues that we were ha like having was that um, Deb had to constantly do is like, what is the mission of this? Is it, it's about healing, it's not about you. But there was, there was always in, in my mind as I was going through and writing the novel is about, like I wanted to show focusing on punishment, like putting people in cages and making, having them as slaves, work as slaves, like while they're locked up. And then the people who die in prisons, the, the fact that we're like, everyone here pays for a process that does not help prevent crime is not helpful. And that was kind of always on the back of my mind going through this. And that was, but it, it was 
a thing that, like I said, Deb and everyone was trying to keep in check when it was coming more to the part of how do we heal from this situation? How do we make this about healing? So, restorative justice. So one of the, the biggest things that we had to do to make this about like that she had to keep on wrangling with me about was about phrasing and I didn't understand. It was, it was really hard for me to, to take on and like I said, how much is my story? How much is this about me? And I honestly, it, it's not just, it was, the whole thing is not just about me and I really didn't want it to be. And the other part was ha the, I had throughout, throughout the, for like the first few months of working on the graphic novel, it was constantly, this is, an, this, is, this is about an accident, this is about an accident, this is about an accident. And I had to, she's like, well, you need to start referring it to as a crash because you need to accept that you caused it. And part of it, if it's an accident, then there's no one who caused it. Whereas you caused a crash. And it's a hard, so like, even though I've never denied that I caused it, it was, it was interesting that going through this process, like I'm like learning that I'm even having to accept more of like, take on more of the language, take on more of what happened um, as I'm going through and actually even drawing up this novel and learning to accept more of what happened. And I, to be honest, I was not ready and it has come in phases as I was going through it. So it's another reason, it was, I'm understanding very much more as like how you can do, doing this restorative justice work through art part of the power that comes comes with it. So why why do a story about restorative justice? Why why restorative justice at all? And as I mentioned, it's more about healing. It's about it's about um, it's about healing. Um, I, I strong one of the other systems of um, justice is um, called transformative justice, where you go through and you, you know, if someone steals something, um, you look at, well, is, are they able to get a job that actually pays them a living wage so that they don't have to steal? And that's where you transform a system that affected them beforehand to prevent the crime in the first place. And then you, you actually change that, which I also very strongly support. But even in that case, I feel like you still need a restorative justice aspect because someone, there was still, there's still, you still have to address the harm caused, the harm caused. And that is, that's what restorative justice deals with. And um, one of the other great things is restorative justice doesn't even have to be about justice. It can be, um, we have a, um, a restorative justice group in Longmont that will mediate um, office conflicts. They'll mediate um, youth groups. They'll go to schools and deal with uh, like con like conflicts within a school, and it brings everyone together and it opens everyone up. Like it opens a pathway of conversation so that everyone is listening, responsive, and getting on the same page which, and it's all about, it's not about saying this person did this, it's about, it's more about how do we heal from this thing that affected everyone and, and who did it affect and who's not getting hurt and how do we give them a voice. And if you want more information about it, it just so happens that tomorrow night we're having a big, talk with the campus police and uh, student moderators and or, um, student panelists and other people who, and we have a really great moderator that Carissa found, and we will be talking about different ways to deal with crime in general. So um, definitely um, you can stop by tomorrow night for that and hear about all the different ways 
different types of justice and kind of hear about different opinions and we'll be discussing, yeah, getting different ideas about it and also we'd love to hear everyone's feedback and feel about what their feelings are and opinions and especially I know this campus has also recently been through a whole lot so I know there's a lot of there's probably a lot of thoughts appeal and opinions on the, on the matter as well and also if you want to know more about restorative justice things too as Chris has said at the beginning the graphic novel you can get it right now on um, for free online and also there if you like I have a crowdfunding campaign if you want would like a print version as well so and as I was starting to say why art and restorative justice so the biggest part of um, of restorative justice honestly is that storytelling aspect and sometimes it cannot come it doesn't come from the um, just from the like from the, what happened it has to be from people being able to tell their stories and sometimes it's very hard to tell it directly and sometimes there will never be a time where you will get you know the victim and the perpetrator or whoever like the the people who have been affected um or, or who like in right next to each other and talking to each other face to face that may never happen just like in my situation or even if they're they start on a restorative justice process there might be reasons why they can't be in the same room together um just covid is a great example um where there might be a reason why you can't just get everyone in the room and there's also um it's a different process and sometimes like I from the beginning was very willing to admit what I had done and that's not always going to be the case and art is, an, is a very powerful way to get people to start to have empathy in, in times where they may not have empathy before and maybe see things in a different light where they could not relate before and yeah so like I said it's they need people need to relate to the loss they had to others um, taking responsibility and also the biggest part in the parts that I didn't touch on it's when you have art or a story and you make it external um, one of those biggest things I know for me personally and I think for a lot of um, victims as well is that it's if there's meaning if you can give what happened meaning it helps everyone through the healing process for me being able to go for, for me my whole meaning throughout all of this the prison the everything um, my meaning from this is trying to make sure that no one goes through the same process that I went through and has to learn the lessons that I learned the way I learned them um, and my hope is that no one loses a child the way I caused another family to lose a child and that's that's get, getting meaning from what happened and that's a and I feel like that's a big part of what comes from the restorative justice process if you can actually do that if you can actually pull meaning from it then you've done it's huge it's um it it really I feel like that's a huge source of the healing there all right so publishing for the comic book process I've got two published comics one is just online one is one that I've done one is print only um, for Warp Ranger it was I did it in print it was in um, it I did a first edition 300 issue print and that was sold in comic book shops and we sold it in conventions and like 
like um, yeah, at in-person events. And we learned a lot from doing that. So one thing we learned is the biggest part that I learned from the publishing process on Warp Ranger was like I when I first learned about trying to get it um, the book printed, I was looking at the prices, and in order to get a, a, the book down to a price where we could actually sell it for five dollars a book, I was going to have to buy at least a thousand prints of the book, like which I couldn't afford. That wasn't that wasn't going to be possible. So um, I started asking. I went to the comic book shop. I found an they recommended me talk to another local artist, and he recommended me to the, recommended me to this um, place called Comics Wellspring out of Michigan, and that's when we were able to. He, I found their printing site, and it was that's when I could get it, do a whole run, like the, do a run of three hundred, and get it for five dollars, and sell it for five dollars, and make some sort of profit off of it, and and actually make it like you, the expected profit off of it. Because you can, um, what happened, most online printers like that you look for, they're just, they're, they, you need to order too much. Um, they're too expensive. And Comics Wellspring is geared for small print um, artists and writers, which is really nice. And they'll do graphic novels and paperbacks and, things like that, or even hardcovers if you want to. Plus they have like all the convention gear if you want that as well. Um, so, and so I highly recommend to, if you're going to do a, make a comic or a graphic novel, definitely talk to people like comic book, local comic book writers, find out where, where they're getting printing from and how they're doing it. Um, because that will help you, like they might have a resource you may not know about and that's, what saved us. And part of the reason we wanted to do this was because of this guy. Like the reason we went down the self publishing route. Um, if you recognize that character that's on the screen right now, um, it's probably because you were in a comic book store in the 90s um, or, or you really like um, old 90s stuff. That character is a character named Cerebus. Um, and Cerebus was a self-published comic from the 1970s um, all the way up to about 2000. And it was published by a guy named Dave Sim. And he was known throughout the comic industry for self-publishing. In fact, he would go to conventions and um, make these, he, his, he'd do these amazing several hundred person panels speaking just about the importance of self-publishing and why everyone should self-publish. And basically what, what he, these panels were so impressive that what would happen is people would go in just, you know, to check out the panel or whatever, or just because they want an autograph because they want to talk to Dave Sim and maybe get him to sign their limited edition issue of Cerebus. And then everyone would come out and want to self-publish their own book. Um, that's how powerful he was when talking about it. And because these were so popular and so powerful, he made he went to one convention and for free um, made these things that looked like comics, but they were little zines, and um, they were called Cerebus Guide: The Cerebus Guide to Self-Publishing. And it had everything that he talked about in his panels, including the like the transcription of one of his big Comic-Con panels. And he talked about why you should self-publish and the how, and, and even even go through these steps, one, two, three, of how to self-publish your book. And, um, and Malone just happened to have that limited edition, which now if you wanted to buy one of those, um, on Amazon right now, it ranges from 60 to $100 on Amazon right now. Um, but you can buy a, a, a copy off Dave Sims' website for like $10 if need be. But it's, it's an amazing read, highly recommend that too. But 
you read it and he, he explains that a lot of people, the comic industry knows, Marvel and DC know that the people who want to work in their industry would, if they, if they went up to him and said, hey, we can't pay you, would you do this anyway? And most people would say, yes, because they want to write a Spider-Man or a Superman story or a Batman story and have their name on it. Um, so they're happy to not give writers or artists rights to their right, to their work or whatever. Um, so they get these, um, these amazing talents to come in and write for their characters. And then they, they'll tell, they might tell them, hey, you will give them your rights after the first 10 years. But in the contracts, they have an option to pick up the rights, um, pick up that they have the right of first refusal so they can choose to keep on picking it up, which they do for like books, like really big books like Watchmen or something like that, where they can just keep on getting the rights as long as it's popular. So Dave Sim talks about this is how you publish your own book. This is how you take it to the printer. This is what you need. Um, and then this is how you can kind of help yourself fund it in the meantime. Some of the stuff is a little dated because it's the conventions, when he wrote the book, in the 90s, it seemed like the upward arc of comics was going to be unlimited. Because in the 90s, there was a new comic every day that they would just insert a new character. They would give zero backstory. It was just co like comics were everywhere. They needed a new comic to come out every week. There were new, there was Valiant Comics and there was Image Comics coming out and all these, like all these different comic book Big comic comic ah, companies were coming out all over the place, and there was like no end to it. And people were even sending zines in the mail to everyone. And then the internet came out, and then and it kind of cut that all down. Um, so it's not the same as when he wrote it, but a lot of his ideas behind it still apply today. Um, and you can apply some of what he's saying to online publishing as well. Um, you can take what he's saying about basically if you're publishing something consistently, if you're pu if you have like, if you, you're making a comic and you do one, you publish as you want, the next push six, two, and then you, um, three, four, five, and six. Now you make a graphic novel of one through six, and then you push seven, eight, nine, and then you do seven through 12, and then you make another graphic novel, and then you can sell all those. Um, at a convention, and now you have like a whole big backlog, and then you all of those earn you rights, off like you have rights, and they it might just be pennies that you're earning off of the rights off of all of those, but that comes it comes in over time, but it's also a lot of time making these books, and really what they say is is you make a page a day, um, working on these pages, and then you and then you have like the whole book collected and put it together. But that was kind of, that was the big um, thought behind it. And this is why Malone told me, don't make your Green Lantern story about Green Lantern. He said, don't sell it to DC, keep the rights, make your own character, which is, if you didn't know, Ninja Turtles. That was actually, um, the guy who, Robert Kirkman, was a huge fan of Daredevil. And he, like, so what he did was he took the big Daredevil story arc at the time where Daredevil was fighting this group of ninjas called The Hand, and then he took it and said, I'm going to have these turtles fighting this group of ninjas called The Foot. And um, they're going to have instead of the kingpin, they're going to have a master shredder, and they're going to, and that's the same. He borrowed the same storyline and just rewrote it the way he had it, and then he's he's doing fine. <laughs> and um, so, like, it's a great, it's a great, like that can be a great process, and doing just doing it that way and having his his own storyline or like just making your own storyline even if it's fan fiction off of a character you love that's one way to go about it so conventions um 
that was a big part of what Dave Sim call, talks about and one way to go help, like a big part of making money from your own work. And I think in the 90s, there was probably a lot of, a lot more of interest of people going in there for individual, for um, interesting comics. But the big thing um, that we discovered when going to conventions, they want art, they want, they want um, posters, they want something they can put in a portfolio, they want someone doing really cool Stranger Things or um, uh, Harry Potter or like some, or Star Wars or some sort of like the big fan fiction universes, some cool crazy art that they can put together and hang up on their wall or put it, or like put in this cool art gallery that they have and they build up. And then you reel them in with the, your cool art and then you bring in, then you would have your comic to go along with it and say, hey, if you really like the art I did, you know, my Star Wars art, then you would really like this comic that goes along with it. And a lot of time, and that was, we had, we actually, the first time we were there, we were sitting next to someone who was very, like he had been to um, Fan Expo Denver for years and years and he was making the rounds um, that a, like one of the comic companies was paying him for. And he actually told us, he's like, look, you need to, like you see how I've got this big folder of all these like, these sample arts, it's like you need to have that. You've got, you've got great art, but you need to have, you need to have that available and then they'll come up and then they'll buy whatever comic you have on hand. So, and then as of recently for the graphic novel, crowdfunding, like the, for the crowdfunding, what I was learning is the big things you have to learn to figure out from early on are how are you gonna do it? Are you going to, is it just going, who, where's the money going to? Is it going to just you? Or are you going to have a comic business? Is it going to be, um, and one of the things I didn't do when when setting up my graphic novel is I didn't set up the business early enough and get an EI, like you need to have, like if you're going on Kickstarter, which is the biggest one, the biggest crowdfunding site, um, then you're, you need to have, if you're gonna make it separate so that you make sure that all the, everything is under your business, then you need to make sure your business has an EIN and is, and it, and it has an EIN for at least 90 days prior. Um, otherwise, it's not going to find it. And Kickstarter's not gonna find it and they're not gonna be able to pay you. So that's a big part of it. Um, but you can use some of the, uh, these other um, Kickstarter ones, like right now mine's on Chuffed, which is actually um, an activist-centered one. And if you have certain, like, if you're doing, like, you do like a more activist-centered comic or something like that, it's a really great pat platform. It won't take as big of a percentage of the profits and things like that from, from the crowdfunding, and we'll do it. And it's incredible, it's easy to use, and it's a, it's like a very similar setup. Honestly, all of these are similar setup. Patreon is, is like great if you're, doing like you're constantly putting out different stuff that people can get or like you have like you want to constantly sell new issues through your site then patreon is a good way to do it and i actually i use patreon for like my for our um criminal justice podcast and we talk things we um that's how we get support through that but um yes so I want to make sure that we have time for questions and I'm like very, and um, so what, yeah, does anyone have any questions or any, anything, any topics that anyone wants to hear more about? Yeah. Okay, and I'll just repeat the question for the, for the audience. So, why, why comic book for, why comics as the medium as opposed to video or something else? 
And for, for this project, I, the main reason was just because that was when, when it started out, that was the only pro, the only medium I was working in. Eventually I was doing, um, I actually started working at a media company like after the start of this. So I started working in a whole bunch of different mediums, but the, um, but the, at that time, that was the only medium I was really working in. I was doing a lot of writing, as I said, like, so I did um, writing versus the, um, the comic, but I really, what was interesting about this was I really was curious about if I could tell this story as a graphic novel. And I really wasn't sure. <laughs> I really wasn't sure. And I thought it was going, it was like an interesting graphic novel prompt to see if I could do it. And I like telling stories through graphic novel in, in general, because a lot of the time, um, a lot of the time when I'm writing, I worry, I get too focused on trying to describe a physical, like a character or trying to describe a scene. And then in a, in a graphic novel, I'm like, I don't have to do that. I can just be like, here's the thing, let's move on. <laughs> and let's get, let's get to the actual story chunk. <laughs> Who else? Hmm. All right. Were there any other phrases or anything, uh, other terms that I had to adjust going through the, um, all along the way of the graphic novel for the restorative justice aspect? And that's the biggest one because I remember that one. That one was hard. Um, I think the biggest question, a lot like along that, I don't think there was any word specifically like that where it was like, exchange accident for crash i think it was more of saying like when was i saying i <laughs> and when was i saying when when was i talking about me and when was i talking about the victim's family and also kind of when was i where it was hard because it was trying to one aspect of it too that I, we're, we're coming aware of as the the novel was growing is how do we refer to people in this? Like, and how, how are we referring to them? Because we don't, like, even as I'm doing this presentation, I'm trying to think, it's like, no one, we don't really want to call anyone victim or like, that's not their only thing. They, there's, everyone has been like, uh, they're suffering from this event or they're, they've been hurt by this event and um, calling them a victim or calling them a criminal or calling them a perpetrator, that's giving them a label that might unfairly put them off into a different category and other them from everyone else. And it's hard to figure out when to use those terms so that it's not othering. And that was challenging and I don't think we ever could, like we, I think, Deb, like we didn't really dive too hard on that one. We had some grace on that, on that, but that's a question that kind of runs through my mind a lot of times too, is whether, when can we use those phrases and when is it othering and saying you're a victim and like now you're, you're in that category. So, all right, how have I been able to um, be reflective and flexible throughout the process and while like having this discovery? And it's because it kind of happened in phases. Like, so we had the storyboarding phase. So the way it went down was there was just, just an initial discussion with the idea of the plot, then the storyboarding, and then drawing out each individual page. 
And what ended up happening was the storyboard had to be kind of rewritten a couple times. And even it got rewritten um, in as I was drawing it. Like there was a part where I was just kind of like, okay, I the storyboard initially was 60 pages of that I had drawn, but I had storyboarded out. And then I'm going through, I'm like, this is, I'm never gonna be able to finish this if I do 60 pages. So I'm like, okay, I need to, um, what, where can I, where does the story actually make sense? And so I need to go through and corner it. And honestly, a lot of the stuff that got cut was stuff that was focusing too much on, I was realizing it was a lot of the language where it was me trying to justify the crash. <laughs> it was trying to say, this is, this could have happened to you. This could have happened to da, da, da. It's no, like we just went, we're going past that. We're just going right to, this is what happened. <laughs> and um, so that, that's, so that's part of it that happened. And then when so much got cut that it actually changed the story, then Deb and I had to meet and we had to figure it out. And then the, she also, whenever there was something, like whenever I had made so many changes that it didn't make sense, then I could go back and go through it. Just like I would have to go through and change pages I'd already drawn out or yeah, or change, remove, um, rearrange. And fortunately, like I use Procreate. Procreate, um, it's, Procreate is a great tool for drawing and making comics, and that seems to be one of the standards that people use now. Um, one thing that I would recommend is if you're doing a project in Procreate, always group your layers um, in advance because you're gonna have to go back and do that anyway, most likely. <laughs> yeah. But besides the artistic side of restorative justice, is there any other side of it? So the, one of the main things that they do is um, they actually have circles where um, they go through and they have, they'll have moderators who are kind of trained in the restorative justice process. And they will, they will it, depend, it depends on the situation what, or what it is. So usually, um, the process is they will meet with, like they'll meet with a victim or a certain group of victims and then like the, or and like a perpetrator or something separately. And, or, or like, let's say it's an argument and they'll meet with person A over here, person B over here, and they'll talk with them separately. And then they'll, they'll also, they'll talk with, they'll have the people involved and they'll say, all right, you're all involved. What we're gonna do is we're all gonna meet on this date and this time, and we're just gonna meet in a circle. And we're just gonna have a circle. The moderators are gonna sit somewhere in the circle, and we're just gonna have a conversation. And anyone who has any thoughts, you're just gonna talk, and just whatever comes up. And we're gonna figure out how we can move past it or how we can heal from whatever just happened. And that's, generally the process and this circle it's entirely possible something happens someone gets up and just leaves and then the, what happens is end of circle done and then and then you might have to do it come back and do it again and people have the freedom to leave be hurt have their emotions whatever whatever it is but the the point is that everyone gets a chance an opportunity to speak to and also they state beforehand this is what I'm hoping to gain from it. This is what I'm hoping to have happen. And they might, they might not know what they want. And the, the, the person in charge might say, well, here are some options. What do you think of all these different options? And that's, um, which is very different from like, say, say, say just basically saying, well, we can say, send this person to prison for two to 20 years. <laughs> like. That's your only option. Um, so it's, 
it's giving it's trying to work together to try and see how like it's it's usually in the process it's usually more about talking and just hearing what other people have to say and trying to get them together and sometimes like i said they can't get them together so they might record a video and just have them talking so it doesn't it doesn't necessarily have to have an artistic component at all or anything like that but that would be the the main forms of restorative justice it also one of the big things that a lot of restorative justice groups do is for juveniles they'll actually have them like if they do something they'll actually work so that they don't get a criminal charge they work with the person that they hurt so that they can figure out some alternative so that they don't have to get a charge and then they don't have that on their record growing up Yes. Do you think that restorative justice is something that could Do you believe that restorative justice can be given to anybody who has committed the most heinous of crimes? Do I think that restorative justice can be given to anyone or used on anyone, even the most heinous crimes? And I think that it's actually, I, not only do I think it can be used on anyone, but I think it can be more powerful for more heinous crimes because it can have more impact. The, but I will qualify it by saying this. As I said before, not everyone takes responsibility for what they have done, like what, what they have done. And that is a key part of the restorative justice process. And it's that part of the process to enable to have healing that's kind of like the starting point and if you can ha if someone can if people can take responsibility and kind of move and start that process then there is i feel like there is a lot that someone who has caused a lot of hurt for other people um to actually help them and I say that because part of the inspiration for, for my graphic novel was because when I killed this family's son and I would have done anything for this family, anything right after the accident, um, there is very little I would have, like if they had said, like, let's, they wanna talk to you, they wanna do this, they wanna do that, like I would have happily dropped everything and anything to do whatever they needed to help them in any way I could see. Um, that wasn't an option. And what ended up happening was through the sentencing process, I ended up hurting them more. And the thought, the, the, the thought of that to this day really bothers me. <laughs> and um, I, like, so I feel like there is a lot more that can be done if there's, like, especially for people who've done a lot of harm, if they can have a chance to, to work directly with those people. Through, and a restorative justice process does that in a way that, will, that is the least likely to cause damage to the people who've already been hurt. Yes. There are a lot of people who end up in the restorative justice process who do end up in that situation where they do, and it's part of that. And one of the things that the moderators do a lot of time is that they, that's one of the first things they bring up is like, you are not taking responsibility. You're not, you have not taken responsibility for yourself um, in, this, in this case. And that, and honestly, it's a case by case basis on how do they, how it gets handled and it really it ends up being because sort of justice is a process really it's a community process because it's not it's not up to the moderator to decide how they're going to handle it 
but it's one of the first things the moderator is going to have to bring up to the community because if the community comes up that's like any problem it's like if you have a leaky roof and the roof keeps on leaking in the same exact spot over time apparently whatever's like putting tape over it isn't working like it's you have to something more is going to have to be done and the question is is what what is it what's going to have to be done and how how is it going to need to be addressed and that's and and the, the nice part is it's it's a community decision about how how people whatever it is whether it's the first time or the tenth time how it's going to be done yes The question is, is then, yeah, and I think the question is, is like how, because there's going to be another, if the community decides that or anyone in the community decides that, they're like, we don't, like, I don't feel comfortable with you in the community. It's like how, then the question, there's going to be the comeback of, well, what does that mean and how is that person going to, to like leave it like how like wh what does that actually end up meaning and the other the other aspect is is well there's a but there's other ways that they can leave the community than going like necessarily going to a prison or whatever it is so i'll catch it this way look i don't know of any as I know a lot of people who've worked in restorative justice, and I haven't heard a situation where they've actually gotten to that point, because they usually, once again, it's usually trying to work for something that ensures that everyone is comfortable in the community. And so usually that would mean that the process is failing if, no, if, they're not, if people are not feeling comfortable in the community still by the end of it. There are things, if you're going to send someone outside of the community, a lot of times there are, there are resources out there for it, but the question is, can they access them? Like, treatment is a resource. There are ways to, and like, are there help for whatever, caught, like, can, for that person so they can come back to the community and actually contribute? And, one of the major issues I see in society as a whole is we don't have anything for, for really big issues. I feel like we don't even offer things like that. Um, we send them out then like into a blank, like prison is just send them out and then they're gonna come back and then we don't know, like, and then we're gonna hope that they're better when they come back. Um, so, these are, but like, like I said, the whole point, the focus from the restorative justice angle is that everyone has to be, should feel safe by the end of the process. If someone might, I could see someone needing to like go get some, go through some sort of treatment, going and getting some sort of help through the process. But since it's never been used for super, like, it's you rarely used for really big issues, I don't, I don't think it gets you, gets to that point. Yes. So what do you think would happen if, if victims or survivors of, of certain crimes were against restorative justice for the people who have done horrible things to them? Would they be able to get the support? Well, if they're against it, then that would stop the process. From st OK, so what would happen if victims, uh, a victim of a crime was against the, the restorative justice process? And that would basically put an end to the process from the beginning because they couldn't they couldn't have the process um, it's once again I, the only way the process works is if everyone's coming in there with 
like trying to work it out or hoping that they're or seeing if there's some way that they can work it out. And if there's no way from the start, um, then it's there's no it's just like if someone comes in and they they will not they adamantly deny that anything even happened. Um, and they won't they won't it would be difficult to do that. I will say there are there are people who have a lot of times for tough situations they do talk they like the specialist will go in there and they will talk to him like they talk to him and be like is there any way like what can we do what could happen what what do you want honestly that's usually the main thing they go when they first make contacts like what do you want what do you what would you like to have happen and what resources do you need and it's not necessarily what would you like to have happen to that person it's what do you need for you in general what do you need what what do you need for to for your life which is not something i see offered right now like i don't see prosecutors or police or anyone offering that right now yes Okay, so what would the solution be for people, for like serial killers, for serious, serious offenders, um, other than prison? And so before I went to prison, I went to treatment. And the difference between, so treatment and prison, you both get removed from society, period. You get, you're, you're out, you're not living at home, um, your method of communication is removed. Um, the difference between treatment and prison is that the staff in prison, their only mission is to make sure you do not leave. Um, they also a little bit of you need to obey whatever we're saying. The staff at a treatment set facility is trying to help to ensure that you are getting the help you need so that you get better. and. Um, if we actually set up something like that so that people are actually trying to get rehabilitated wherever they go, whatever that is, um, cause there will, I think there will be times where people will have to be removed cause there are, I, there are serious problems as you mentioned, where they'll have to come out. But if they're in a treatment type situation, what, instead of being removed into another, into a situation where now they're kind of constantly having to watch their batch, they're guarding themselves, they're kind of, it's always under threat and there's no one, it's, you know, you're just basically out for yourself, period, um, and you're defending yourself, then you, then um, as opposed, to, uh, if you're doing that versus you're in treatment where you're actually, everyone's trying to help each other and trying to help get out. Um, then there's a chance of like healing so that when they do eventually get out, they won't do what they did again or some, some other form, you know, something else that hurts someone else when they get out. And a lot of, a lot of people, part of the reason why the recidivism rate is so bad is because a lot of times they're just there's no one part is that when you get out it's just like you can fail just by the conditions of like um just the parole conditions and so you don't have the same conditions as a regular citizen and then second and then also you don't have you probably if you the money you spent on your lawyer or whatever um to before going into prison, you don't have any more, or you spent like you don't have any money or your resources, or you lost your people while you were locked up. You don't have those resources anymore. So now, 
you come out, you've lost all of these resources, and now you've got to figure it out on your own. And uh, it's it would be very challenging for anyone, whether or not they pr commit, committed a crime before or not, to just be out in the world without any of those resources. And especially if you've lived in a situation where it was like, seriously, it's, it's hard to s summarize in a very short time, but it's like, you, I had to learn how to sneak around in prison because it's, that's kind of the way it's designed. Um, so the, I would much rather people be in a place where they learn how to be awesome citizens and, like, and learn how to help each other out. Then when they come out, it's second nature that they've, they're helping other people out. So I think that, that would be the solution, but we just, that doesn't exist right now. We have time for like one or two more questions, if anybody has has any. Yeah. It's the Boulder County Restorative Justice. They're part of the. They were. They work with Boulder County Probation. They're part. They're just. They're part. They're a department within the county. Yeah. I really appreciate the questions and they've it's yeah. Um very thoughtful and I'm thankful for the the questions and honestly yeah, I'm very thankful for the for for your time today and everything too. Just before you all leave real quick, um, I just wanted to also give uh, a thank you to the departments on campus that helped us bring Ryan and we'll also just thank you for Ryan. Yay, I know we just clapped, but yay. Um, but I wanted to thank our Student Government Association, um, the College of Letter Arts and Sciences, Vice Chancellor of DEI, the Kramer Family Library, and the Center for Religious Diversity in Public Life. Um, and thank you for coming to our first event. Have a great day.